And, you know, I'm the co-host of a paranormal podcast, but I have to admit, I'm ex- I have extreme skepticism and caution about all the things that are happening. You know, he has the, for example, just like you said with the closed session, he, and he has the best Southern accent of the group, but also, as I've heard, the <laughs> lowest security clearance. So yeah. to believe that they are going to reveal classified information to Tim Burchett, or others who literally don't have the clearance to hear said classified information, you know, that's not going to happen. But I have extreme skepticism, extreme caution here. In 1947, something happened in Roswell, New Mexico. I believe we still don't know what real what really happened. Just shortly after Roswell, incidentally, we had the formation of the CIA and the Air Force. The yeah. same Air Force, by the way, which we barely hear anything from on the UFO, UAP topic. And it, there's a book I love called Day After Roswell by Corso. You know, this ain't our first go-round with high-level whistleblowers. We've been told a lot of this stuff before. All right, just read Day After Roswell. In 1963, the President of the United States was assassinated. Some people say it had something to do with UFOs. Even today, 60 years later, they've released more documents. There's still at least 5,000 documents that they still won't release. That happened in 1963. And there was a very interesting name that popped up. I was telling Smitty about this. He apparently was the guy that intercepted the mail of Oswald. It seems that in the 50s, him and a, and a Georgia politician and a colonel from the army had a UFO encounter in Russia, believe it or not. This is in the J- newly released JFK files. But to believe that we still can't get the information for the assassination of JFK 1963 and that Wednesday next week we're going to find out that extraterrestrials exist, I think is a huge stretch a huge leap of faith. I have extreme caution because we do not know the motivations of all the parties involved in this. And we can be assured there are many parties with many different motivations here. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, This world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. Did the CIA write Wind of Change by the Scorpions? (laughs) (laughs) As humans busied themselves about the various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Dr. Loeb, what percentage chance do you give it that you have indeed uncovered extraterrestrial or non-human technology? With infinite complacence, people went about their affairs Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, intellects vast and unsympathetic through their plans against us. Prior to your abduction, did you believe in UFOs or any sort of alien life form? All things unexplained. So some of that I think there will say for close session. The following is from our guest appearance on the Calling All Beings podcast. Find them on YouTube or wherever you podcast at Calling All Beings. I want to uh, hit a topic that uh, I I wrestle with a lot, and I think you guys probably have as well. Uh, And it is related to UFOs. That's, you know, kind of more my wheelhouse. But we have a legacy of, geez, I guess at at least 70 years, 70 plus years of of stories, uh, you know, about about this topic. And, of course, there are stories that predate that. You mentioned one a minute ago. Uh, 
but with the U.S. government's involvement with the topic, we have a, a legacy of, uh, I think many would argue, obfuscation, uh, disinformation, uh, you know, shadowy behavior. And uh, we're entering into an age, and, and this morning the press conference with uh, uh, Representative Burchett is a good example of this, where we have uh, at least elements within the government who are trying to uh, pry the secrets out of you know, out of these dark places. But I think many in the community wrestle with, because we've, we've been gaslit for so long, you know, what is the actual truth here? What is the kernel of truth in all of the, this story? And I think most people in the modern world would argue that they, they understand governments uh, tell a story, right? Most adults understand that, that, that governments are telling them a story. And it's not the complete picture. And, and as parents, we do this, right? We, we tell our kids stories. We don't tell them every single detail that they need to know. We tell them what, what we think they need to know when we, at the age that they are at and where they are at in their own development, what we think is going to help them grow. Uh, of course, that doesn't always work, right? Sometimes they see through <laughs> that story. <laughs> exactly. They call our BS. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I know that's a long preamble, but I'm just really struggling here with when we have representatives from these agencies, we have uh, folks who are trying to get the, the information out. You know, how do you apply discernment uh, with this legacy of dis disinformation from the same kind of government? And, and obviously we all recognize that the government is not a, a monolithic institution. It's made up of individuals. But how do you approach the, this topic of disinformation? People have asked me this question, and normally what I'll say, you know, Tim heard me go on, you know, I've given him some of what I believe is my expertise in the knowledge of the order of operations of government and how they think and how they're likely to react in a given situation. And this is one I've stayed away from because it presupposes that I know everything they know and have been advised by, for example, um, uh, you know, cabinet level and, and, you know, maybe top government level sociologists and psychologists and that are giving them information as to how they think the American public might react. They really don't care how they're going to react to it in, in, um, you know, Mongolia, uh, or, or in, you know, Navarre or, or France, like they really don't care. They really just care in this case about how the Americans are going to react to it. And with a, a little tinge towards, uh, five eyes, uh, countries. So, um, so I, I'm not sure what the appropriate amount is, but if, if you're just asking me personally, I would say something like the nature of what we've found that they can characterize what we've discovered, what we to, to a degree have, uh, where we think it, it's derivation is like what David said, a co-located physical dimension or a, a a physical space dimension that is co-located with ours, something like that. I think they should speak to that. Uh, just they would have to leave out maybe what they've derived from the craft, but at the same time, I also think that um, that uh, they should be speaking toward think coming up with a plan to bring in truly the best and brightest that our country and our international partners in terms of scientists and engineers to look at this material and see if we can actualize something that, uh, as Dave Grush said, is going to solve real world problems, energy, propulsion, you know, zero, zero, zero mission sort of uh, air travel propulsion and, and, and energy creation. I think uh, just keeping it to uh, smaller groups of people obviously hasn't worked. And it also may not work if we bring in the best and brightest, but you have to do that first, you know. So th that's my take on it, uh, Matt. Yeah, this one's kind of a tough one, uh, as they usually are. <laughs> Sorry, Whenever Matt. it comes to this sort of thing, uh, we're dealing with the trickle of information that the government is giving us, whatever they feel is worth our knowledge or okay for public consumption. And I believe at this point, all we can do in terms of discernment is just deal with that information and that information alone. Uh, to go beyond that, we're immediately jumping in the deep end of the speculation pool. 
and trying to guess things uh you know the drone thing comes to mind so like i believe and i could be completely wrong but i believe the united states military uh was doing stuff with drones in like the 1950s now in the public sector you know in the past five years or so drones have kind of become a thing and that tends to be the case with everything the government releases uh in terms of information for public consumption we're way behind where they're at so if this is the information that they're giving us right now where are they actually at and the people that know where they're actually at who can even access that information I mean, Senate hearings and all that, great. I'm all on board with that. But, I mean, a president lasts four to eight years. They are briefed, maybe, maybe not, probably depending on who the president is, on this information. So somebody decides if the president gets to hear that information or not. I don't think the truth, the real information that they have, is accessible by anybody unless they say so. It doesn't matter what Senate hearings you put together, what committees are formed, what, you know, court orders are made. It doesn't matter. It's beyond that. It's too top secret. So I don't think we should even try to discern anything at this point and just wait and see like we've been doing and figure out where we go from there. And, and Nathan, I just want to add on before we go to um, Debs that um, I would love to see a day when even our global uh, global power competition rivals, Russia and China, when even when we can cross flow and, and have their scientists looking at, at our tech and ours looking at theirs. And then, you know, maybe as a, as a world, we could figure this out together and see if we can, you know, uh, spend a longer period of time on the planet. Uh, than, than perhaps we're slated to now. But uh, that's like a pipe dream, perfect world kind of thing. But it would be nice that if even beyond five eyes, we, we would go. Uh, Debs, please. Uh, tack- Nathan, so basically you want to know what, what she thinks we should know, is that, or, or what what, what we should be told? Discernment. Yeah, it's, yeah, discernment. it's about go the ahead. discernment. Okay. So, okay, so what I do is I think about the gains. Like, would there be a gain to do a global PSYOP? No. That's ridiculous. Would there be a financial gain for pushing this? No, they don't need to do that. They have money. They don't need to do that. Um, Would there be a gain for keeping this a secret? Absolutely, because they can keep the advanced technology for themselves. Um, They can keep it out of the hands of um, foreign um, adversaries and so on and so forth. So I always think about gains. That's what helps me discern things. Like, what would they have to gain if they do this? And right now, it seems like Congress wants to gain control over this topic. And that's why they're doing what they're doing. So there's that gain issue right there. They also will probably get an uptick in votes if they are, you know, appearing to be trustworthy and transparent for the population. But it's, it's worth noting that even, you know, what what I have read with the proposed amendment doesn't make me feel like we're necessarily going to get the information ourselves. It's for Congress. So it's about their gain again. You know what I mean? So it, that's how I go through it. I just like think about what is what is someone gaining? So that's how I do my discernment. I like it. They're definitely out on a limb. That's for sure with what they're they're asking for. Even I spoke with Christopher Sharp editor of Liberation Times today, and he's almost like scared of, of what's going to come out <laughs> if he's ready for it. Or he's questioning whether or not he's ready. But uh, with that, let's go with uh, Miss CJ. Yeah. So, you know, Representative Tim Burchett, Burchett, I'm not sure yep. how to pronounce it, but Burchett, he, he said, Bur- hey. <laughs> are you a foes, y'all? He's, he <laughs> said, you know, more people believe in UFOs than believe in Congress right now. And and I think that that's true. Nobody trusts what is being fed to us. Every time we have one of these UAP hearings, we get nada from them. I think that what we know is only the tip of the iceberg. Every time something comes out, it's big news for about a day, maybe two days. We talk about it on our show. I'm sure you talk about it on your shows. And then it 
disappears, right? We don't think about it anymore. They have a way of doing that. I get pulled in a couple of different directions because I have a lot of family and friends that work in aerospace for Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop, those sorts of entities that tell me all the time, CJ, you just have no idea what sort of technology we have out there. If you knew what was out there, you wouldn't sleep at night. So I have all of these people that are trying to tell me that what we're seeing, what's what's being seen, what's being interpreted as a UAP is actually our own technology. But I don't know that that's fully the case. I think that there's a lot happening that is not our own technology. I do believe that the government believes that as well and that they're keeping that information from us. Many of the people that we've interviewed on our show had experiences in the 60s, 70s, 80s, what have you. And even in those times, they thought that the government was slowly leaking information to us. And yet here we are still with the blindfold over our eyes, not really knowing what's going on. I'm not sure that we're going to find out. I've told a few of my friends that I feel like it's a slow leak from a tire, right? Like a slow leak from a tire or something that you can kind of continue patching and you you just keep putting that patch on and keep on driving versus like an explosion of a tire. And that's what the government is doing. They're slowly leaking information so that we'll be safe, so that we'll be prepared versus just, you know, full on fatal accident on the freeway. <laughs> so I, I think they know so much more than they're telling us. And it's frustrating for me personally. And just just to add on to that, I mean, we're going on 19 years since the Tic Tac incident. And uh, David Grush said himself when Ross Coltart asked him, not our technology, not not human tech. So there may be some, you know, when somebody says that you wouldn't believe what we'd have out there, there are some spectacular, uh, some spectacular aviation. I'm in aerospace myself, but I, I, I don't know what they're referring. What, what does that mean to me? You know, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to ask him. Um, because I haven't seen a whole lot that goes beyond Bernoulli's theorem and uh, Newton's laws of motion in terms of how we propel craft. Um, so if they're saying they've got something that's that's beyond that, then we're really in a in a good place. Um, yeah, and I want to just before I get over Smitty, I wanted to jump in real quick on what CJ said because I uh, it resonated with me a lot. So I, this is the reason why I don't think it actually is ET. Um, because I think if it were ET, it would have been a lot simpler to explain a lot longer, like a long time ago. Um, I think the the real truth of it is a lot more complicated, and it, it sort of it, it probably took a while for whoever was exposed to this to even understand what it was. Uh, and then as they gained, gained understanding, well, we probably still don't understand all of what it is, to be honest with you. Um, but if you think about like where the worldview was at the time that we were having official encounters with this technology or capability or whatever we want to call the phenomena, uh, most people were operating in a really kind of basic understanding of the world and of the universe. I mean, our, our, even our understanding of, of, of science and math was pretty rudimentary. And so it would, be, it would have been irresponsible of them to just sort of like dump it on the laps of everyone uh, who who had no frame of reference for dealing with this. And so if you think about where we are now, though, I'm not saying we're, we're really in a great place to deal with it, but we're in a better place to deal with it because reality is a lot weirder now. Uh, and, and none of us really like, we already don't have a consensus on, on truth. Like we understand that things are really confusing and gray and, and with AI technology that is coming online, like we we understand that reality is very much like what you make it. And so I, I think about this a lot, this sort of con, uh, um, convergence, right, of, of where we are as a society and where whatever this happens to be, maybe we're at a place, a closer place where we have a little bit more of a parity and an ability to understand what it actually is and, and the, the timing of where we are. Quick question for you, Nathan. Do you think the general populace is more fearful of it being in a co-located physical dimensional space to ours than if it's extraterrestrial flying here from some other planet and and flying out or coming through a portal do you think there's a, a difference in terms of what you know what people would fear more yeah well i mean it, it would occupy your mental space a little bit more i think right okay. it's um if, if there's a, it's one thing to say like i mean we all understand this right um, I live in, you know, we all live in our houses, or whatever, and there we know that there are germs. We know that there are bugs. These are tiny little things that we co-locate with us every single day, and we don't think about them a whole lot. You know, sometimes we get sick, and we know that's the germs. Sometimes we get, you know, bit. We know that's a bug. 
um, we don't think about it a whole lot. It's a whole different story, though, when we're talking about another intelligence that could like come into your bedroom or something and, and literally do something to you again against your will that's that obviously transcends the you know minor annoyances of getting a cold or being a, uh, being bitten by a mosquito or something so i think that would occupy a lot, a lot of mental space i mean as a parent it would bother me obviously a lot uh sure. you know but think about flying right like if you're in an airplane and you're thinking just like you know this is a standard airplane flight but you're, people already have like a baseline level of anxiety about flying right but you add on top of that like well i you're telling me these things are real they could show up at any moment and like you know intersect with our plane or i mean i think <laughs> it just could create a lot of panic that maybe we're not well equipped to deal with um so yeah, we're gonna have to navigate those waters, right? If that's something that that becomes more uh, readily agreed upon that they're that they're here and that they can do that and be and be present with us anywhere. Um, and so I encourage people to call Nathan if there is some sort of grand disclosure <laughs> or inescapable event that we've all seen on the news. But please, uh, Smitty, give I us. I want to jump time. in real quick. Yes, ma'am. Please. Super quick, and I think you're yes, so right, Nathan. We had we had Bob Salas on our show mm. a few weeks ago, and um, you know he was famous. Nuclear nuclear weapons were shut down while he was um, on duty, but. Midway through our conversation, he said, yeah, you know, it details my alien abduction. And I, you know, that was the first time I had heard that he had ever been abducted. So he told us that story. And then he told us that he thinks that they are actually abducting kids in the middle of the night and trying to like rebrand them essentially. Mm. I, I didn't sleep for weeks. I mean, I truly lost so much sleep over that. So I think there is something to what you're saying about like, even if we think that we're ready, we're okay, we've accepted AI, whatever. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe yeah. we're not ready to think that things like that could happen. Totally. Yep. Terry Loveless is one you guys want to hear about uh, seeing uh, two Air Force guys seeing going aboard a craft and them seeing children over there. It's very, very unsettling that there were children aboard that craft. But l let me get Mr. Smitty in here, sir. Okay. Anyhow, I'm, I'm kind of along the lines of, of a lot of you. I think we're being spoon-fed exactly what they want for us to know for example you know truman didn't even know about the atomic bomb until he became president and i'm talking about this is as you know the highest level of our government and they don't even tell them about a bomb that we have that could in essence change the the whole war and did change the war uh two i have a friend who uh uncle was in the cia he says, I can't really tell you a whole lot about anything I did. He says, see, I can tell you this. the tech, Some of the new technology we have now, we've had for years and years and years, but we would not release it to the public because you think if we release some things to the public, whatever it might be, let's just say uh, an engine that ran you know, 100 miles a gallon, it would cause a collapse of a large part of our economy. So I don't know how much of this stuff we can, as, as a group of people in the United States, handle how much panic would ensue if we knew the whole story of everything that was going on, whether it is military technology or whether it's extraterrestrial, it would still cause, uh, I believe, a huge panic and, and possibly lead to mass chaos. Uh, but that's my thoughts on it. People stocking up on bleach and hand gel and all the toilet paper they have at dollar store. So uh, <laughs> right. an all aloe right. vera. <laughs> yeah, an aloe vera. Yeah, thank you. Next topic. Let me see. We have, I believe we have um uh, did Tim Matt? get a chance to respond on that? Just wanted to make oh, sure. Oh, Tim, did you no, not? I oh my god, more. Tim. I'm sorry. I had a little more to say than aloe vera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my my, I'll I will rewrite my my list of people because of mine's out of sorts. Go ahead, sir. But I did have a flashback of running to the uh, grocery store in a mad panic to buy aloe vera so that I could create my own hand sanitizer in 2020. And I just was lucky enough to get a tip. Like a lady literally gave me a tip. Like, yo, I hear down at the Aldi they got, you know, like a couple of cases of aloe vera left. So I rushed down there and snagged like I, I'm not gonna say how many I got, but I still got. <laughs> I still got some Primo uh, homemade hand sanitizer if anybody needs some. But, look, uh, I got to comment on something Nathan said. I just had this thought experiment pop in my head when Nathan was bringing up the microscopic organisms that surround us, and I thought 
That's a brilliant analogy, Nathan. I appreciate that. But my thought experience was I, I can't help but wonder, is it possible? <clears throat> not, not, I'm definitely not talking about COVID here, by the way. Is it possible that <laughs> NHIs could have been created in a laboratory and unleashed on us at some point in, in our present or perhaps in our ancient past? I'm just saying that's just a thought experiment. But anyway, y'all, I, I think we're going to hear a lot of this on Wednesday, July 26th at the UFO hearing. So some of that I think, sir, will save for closed session. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, exact, that's exactly right. I'm not compelled by that that grouping, uh, Tim, because uh, we got one person who we've heard and we want to hear more from, and we have the other two we've heard ad nauseum on 75 different shows. Uh, but that's that's how yeah. this process goes, man. You're just going to be disappointed every time. I would like to have heard new people that we had not heard from yet. Well, and and you know, I'm the co-host of a paranormal podcast, but I have to admit, I'm ex- I have extreme skepticism and caution about all the things that are happening. You know, he has the, for example, just like you said with the closed session, he and he has the best. Southern accent of the group, but also, as I've heard, the <laughs> lowest security clearance. So yeah. to believe that they are going to reveal classified information to Tim Burchett or others who literally don't have the clearance to hear said classified information, you know, that that's not going to happen. But I have extreme skepticism, extreme caution here. In 1947, Something happened in Roswell, New Mexico. I believe we still don't know what real what really happened. Just shortly after Roswell, incidentally, we had the formation of the CIA and the Air Force. The yep. same Air Force, by the way, which we barely hear anything from on the UFO UAP topic. And it, there's a book I love called Day After Roswell by Corso. You know, this ain't our first go round with high level whistleblowers. Okay. We've been told a lot of this stuff before. All right, just read Day After Roswell. In 1963, the President of the United States was assassinated. Some people say it had something to do with UFOs. Even, you know, even today, 60 years later, they've released more documents. There's still at least 5,000 documents, y'all, that they still won't release. That happened in 1963, and there was a very interesting name that popped up. I was telling Smitty about this. The guy, I can't rem- remember his name, but but you, you all can look this story up. He apparently was the guy that intercepted the mail of Oswald, but it, it seems that in the 50s, him and a, and a Georgia politician and a colonel from the Army at a UFO encounter in Russia, believe it or not. This is in the newly released JFK files. But to believe that we still can't get the information for the assassination of JFK in 1963 and that Wednesday next week we're going to find out that extraterrestrials exist, I think is a huge stretch, a huge leap of faith, okay? I have extreme caution because we do not know the motivations of all the parties involved in this. And we can be assured there are many parties with many different motivations here. This, we know China has infiltrated the United States on many levels. And what I'm afraid of is that we're going to overlook some very important stories that really are happening around us. Okay. Could China want to invade Taiwan next week? Sure, they could. Could that be the beginning of World War III? Absolutely. Might China have incredible motivation to find out what sort of advanced technology we do have? You better believe it. And by the way, what better way for China and Russia to find out what sort of advanced technology, be it UFO or not, that we've got than for our own selves to find out and tell them? We need to be extremely cautious about that sort of thing, in my opinion. And the other thing that scares me, I am scared by the legislation, by Chuck Schumer and others, and here's why. I applaud bipartisanship, but I still 
cannot help it, y'all. I'm like Smedia. I grew up on X Files. Trust no one. I think the truth is out there, but these are still politicians. And I don't want to be in such a rush for disclosure today that 20 years from now, I'm regretting the loss of freedoms that have happened because of that. We don't know when we start going down this slippery slope of laws. It's it's easy to give up a freedom and to say, okay, you, private company, you've got to reveal your secrets to us. But it's going to be very hard to get those freedoms back ever, you know, once we give them up. So I'm really cautious about that. I think we need to be very careful and, um, you know, we should all be prepared with our emergency kits because you never know what's going to happen. I had I had this discussion with Christopher today, and it, it's very difficult to navigate some of what's going. Well, first of all, relative to politics and Schumer, everybody's in this for politics at one level or another. That's that's not unique to one party or the other. And hopefully there's some genuine interest by some of these guys and gals. That's that's what I hope. Uh, but. Either way, for us, we don't care how we get it as long as they give us some information, uh, at least in a safe manner. Second of all, if let's assume that there's a craft that's being held by a private company. If is it in the interest of the U.S. government to say to company X, and I'm not going to name a company because we don't know what company that would be, so I'm not going to attribute uh, to a company Hey, yeah, go ahead and retrieve this craft that that uh, crashed in Iowa cornfield. Okay, so they go retrieve it. Okay, how is it in my interest as a government to do that? Now, if it's their intellectual property, you're right. We can't take it back from. So it's more than likely that it was some, first of all, let's say there's local or state police that show up to a crash. And then all of a sudden, Company X rolls in and says, hey, yeah, we're going to go ahead and take this and we're going to truck it off. And be like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to do anything. So the government is going to be involved in some way in every one of these that happened. And then there's a difference between ownership and custodial responsibility. So if they allow a contractor to haul this off to their facility, there more than likely is a contractual relationship, a memorandum of agreement, and there's probably a contracting officer representative on site regardless if it is at company X's facility in Provo, Utah, or name name a city, okay? And that contracting officer representative is reporting back weekly on what is being done with that material and what they've actualized or not. Otherwise, there's no point in letting a contractor go and retrieve a craft unless you think you can get something from it. From their side, from the contractor side, do you want to pay a group of people to not only secure it, but have to pay these people to come in? No, you want to be under contract so that you're being paid to pay them. And usually it's a relationship whereby uh, if they were paying uh, Tim and myself $100,000 uh, in salary to be engineer or scientist on this craft, they're being paid, the company from the government, probably $160,000 uh, or $140,000. But there's always a uh, an advantage that the company is being paid over and above what we make. So that's more than likely what's happening. And it it's in some cases, it may be their intellectual property, but it's not in the U.S. government's interest to do that. Um, it also, it's very helpful. There's so much that we don't know, Tim, that we have to kind of say, okay, if there's so much we don't know, that's 90% of this, 99%. What do we know? Okay, we do know Christopher Mellon and what his background is and what he has came out for. We do know Lou Elizondo giving up his career in government. We do know that David Grush not only gave up his career in government, gave up his Air Force Reserve Commission, and now is 36-year-old that is now not employed by the government, not going to get his retirement, et cetera, et cetera. So the motives of, of, of one individual, we know, hey— <laughs> Um, they're they're not in cahoots with him, hoping he's going to disclose something. They're trying to shut him up, which is why he made two IG complaints against them, uh, because the first one just got him in in more hot water than than he was when he he said, "I want access to these programs. I'm with Arrow, or I'm with the uh, UAP task force." And they said, "We don't care. You're not getting access." So he said, "Well, I'll file an IG complaint. Okay, then we'll maybe we'll break in your house, or we'll just." 
you know, harass you. So then he filed a complaint with the ICIG. So it's not what we don't know, because that's most everything. You have to go with what we do know, someone who has skin in the game, who gave up something. So the opposite is true. The government is against him, not with him. That's why he's, he's going before Congress, because they can't stop him. He's a private citizen. Uh, if he were in the Air Force and Reserve, maybe they could. Or maybe his boss at work would say to him if he were still a DOD civilian or working for uh, uh, the, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency or the NRO, hey, if you go and do that hearing, you know, maybe you're not going to get promoted. You know, but they, they can't do any of that because he said, bye-bye. That's a courageous person. Anyway, uh, we have to move on to. So I, I wrote it down again, Nathan. So um, yeah, I actually skipped Matt and I took his slot. So we're going to start. I think it's Matt's turn. Mr. Matt, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Please. Uh, talking about politics and all this stuff, just for a second. Uh, I see this as, again, something that's not either this or that, but a lot of different things. And especially in today's uh, climate with, you know, China and Russia and everything going on, this is also a perfect opportunity for the United States government to uh, kind of pull a power move. It's a lot like playing, you know, Texas Hold'em. We don't know what cards they have, but they're showing the world, okay, well, we're all in. Here's, here's our bet. Do you want to call our bluff or not? So these other government entities around the world, uh, David Grush even spoke about everybody has these retrieval programs. It's not just the United States. But we have to assume that Russia and China, for instance, and I'm just using them as examples because of our current uh, standing with them, they also know about this stuff. They also have their own programs. Right now, with everybody not getting along, the United States is like, yeah, we know stuff. China and Russia have to be wondering, well, what do they know? What technology have they unlocked? What have they turned into a weapon of some kind that they could possibly use against us? So I think there's a lot of things going on besides just letting the general public of the United States know stuff. I think they're sending messages all over the world. I also think that money and power are uh, very driving factors in politics but i think because of this phenomenon being kind of scary i think you got a lot of politicians that are feeling fear and letting that motivate them and you got like deb was saying these real humans these real people that just happen to work for the government or just happen to be politicians are now like hold on a second these things are real well what do you know what what haven't you told us why haven't you told us this you know do i need to be concerned with my children do i need to be concerned with my families and i think that has a lot to do with why they're starting to try and push things now and trying to force the hand uh how that will play out your guess is as, as good as mine anybody else's with what's all your being I'm said so, okay. <laughs> I, I thought i was like i hope there's a question in there <laughs> well unfortunately the question is completely different I'm going on a completely different uh, path with this one because I know that you fine folks have uh, looked quite a bit in the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, obviously, now there's beyond Skinwalker Ranch, but all these different areas like that, that they're discovering and studying and researching and everything, we'll just use Skinwalker Ranch specifically for the point of the question. What is Skinwalker Ranch? Nathan, that's to you. Oh, boy. Um, all right. Well, here's what I think. And this gets back to something we've talked about already. Uh, what if we took the, the tools, the technology, the, the experiments that they've been doing at Skinwalker Ranch and beyond Skinwalker Ranch, these other places? What if we just apply those same techniques anywhere? Right. I mean, we, we have this assumption that these are the places where weird things happen, like because they've been they've been known to happen or people have their stories about these places or whatever. So we, we we fixate on those locations as if that's where, you know, resident ghost happens to live, <laughs> whatever it is. That's their address. Right. Um, what if it's not the case? What if that that's not really how it is? What if that kind of phenomena, that behavior, that strangeness is actually everywhere? And we, it's just, we have to look for it. And if we start looking for it, we will find it everywhere. 
Um, and I think that's where I sort of lean is that um, the reality is really weird and a lot weirder than we think that our models of it are pretty bad uh, that uh, people have real experiences where their reality is shaken and, and changed because of, of, of the way it actually is. And uh, it just so happens that that is everywhere. It's, it's ever present all around us. And, and it's a matter of like turning our awareness to it. Uh, and when I, when we turn our awareness to it, then it becomes visible to us in a way we become aware of it. Um, it's like that story. Um, you guys may have heard this where like, they didn't have the color, uh, was it blue or something like a long time ago? Or it was uh, like, they, they, if you look at ancient literature, like they describe the ocean as being like the color of wine or something like that. Like it, there's this weird uh, story where this notion of blue kind of emerged through at, at, in history and it hadn't really been there before. Of course, blue had been there before, but we hadn't had a, had a way to, to be aware of it, perhaps. Uh, so similarly, that, that might be what's going on here. And it doesn't directly answer your question. But that's how I think about this issue. And for me, I'm going to, myself included, we got to tighten up our answers now because we're about 20 minutes away from two hours. So uh, for me, um, kind of like to think of the Bermuda Triangle, Matt, that, um, you know, there's a certain place where there are some sort of uh, magnetic forces and or these sort of uh, these ley lines, you know, Deb's talked about. Uh, on her show, um, I, I believe there's something there on on that property that perhaps physically they've found it within the mesa. Uh, it seems that they they believe that they have drilled in there and and found something and are are now able to approximate a sh uh, a shape. And also they see reactions. So from scientific perspective, uh, it does appear that there is something uh, anomalous about that particular space. Uh, that, as Nathan said, maybe in a lot of other places, because now they have Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, and they're going to these other places and they're finding an anomalous uh, activity. Uh, but I think it is a place that that definitely, um, maybe there. I you know I've heard Native Americans say that. Uh, I think uh, Jonathan Dover told us he believed that there may have been some sort of a deal between Native Americans and and some sort of. Uh, uh, let's call it a non-human intelligence uh, to be able to use that area underneath the ranch, but um, it it doesn't seem like the most impossible thing that we've heard in the last two months. So um, I think it is a place where uh, there is some activity going on. I believe there's probably even Bigfoot activity there, but for some reason they've chosen not to discuss that on the show. Uh, so now we're going to Deb's. Yeah, so um, I think I agree more with Nathan that any place can be as special as Skinwalker, really. If you just look up, you're going to see a UFO eventually. I think there's that many of them, um, that there are that many anomalous things happening. It's just a matter of paying attention. Um, but I also think that that's a very special area because there's been a lot of radioactivity in that area. Um, and I can't rule out that some of that influences what's going on and might be attracting um, UFOs to the area because um, they seem very interested in radioactive areas. Um, and I think that they should be carrying Geiger counters more often while they're there. That's Deb's new thing. It's all about the Geiger counter, baby. Uh, Julie asked a question in chat, our chat moderator. Jules, um, they can classify a program um there's an original classification authority. People are named that. The uh, president is can declassify anything he wants. The last two presidents we've had with a high clearance are like George H. in the last 50 years are like George H. W. Bush and Jimmy Carter are the only two that actually had like a TSSCI polygraph background check. You know, uh, so uh, I but but yes, any of them can declassify a program. But um, yes, anybody can can uh, justify it to their boss and say, yeah, we need to classify this. And obviously a lot of this information is just overclassified, you know, DOD wide. So, and let, let me jump in on that real quick, yeah. DJ, if that's okay. Sometimes sure. program programs can be classified and not until decades or longer later, do we realize they actually were uh, immoral and illegal. And a great example of that is the Tuskegee airmen 
experiments, mm-hmm. you know, experiments where we've injected our own citizens with syphilis just to see what happens. And so sometimes these programs are not viewed as illegal and immoral until much after the fact. No doubt, man. Historiography and and, and actually not even historiography. I mean, they're just unconscionable things that have happened and, and uh, makes me sick, frankly. Um, let's see, we're going to, uh, that was Deb. So me. CJ goes next. Man. Yeah. I feel like I could talk about Skinwalker Ranch forever, but I'm going to keep it brief with our time. Um, of course there's a show, right? There's a history channel show. So you've got the drama, you've got the spectacle, you've got all of that going on. However, having had a few of the individuals on our show after we stopped our recording and they started talking and I wish we could have recorded it. They're just real people. They're real people. And this is their job. And they 100% fully believe that something is happening on this ranch that is special. And for that reason, I too believe that there's something happening on that ranch that is special. I do not think it's the only place where these things are happening. I think that their future show is proof of that. And to Nathan's point, I do not want any of their technology coming to my home to look for things because I don't want to know. I'm happy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm happy to just go about my day and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, you know, think these things are happening to other people. Tim, like, could you see if there's 1.6 gigahertz next time you're over no, at CJ's no, place, no, please? No, 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 no. So. It reminded me of the black light in the college dorm. Like, just not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going next to um, Smitty, please. I, I'm kind of same along the lines of CJ. I believe it is a special place, and that you know, but this technology, I wish they could take it to other places like Devil's Den and and other other areas and see what's going on there's so many places that exist i believe that are similar to skinwalkers ranch they just are focusing on this so much that it is pulling back the veil per se in this particular area where you know there's so many things that exist out there that are unknown that would be nice if we could take that technology and just go out now that's kind of what they did in in the next show Mm-hmm. That we talked about, but uh, as long as we don't take it to CJ's house, it gets to be okay. Yes, we do not want to measure. Yeah. So t- please Universe, leave your measuring. If you're listening, do not visit me. Just keep it away. Keep it away. <laughs> so Nathan, you know, one other thing I forgot to mention. Another thing that smell. makes Skinwalker Ranch very interesting is Robert Bigelow's involvement in it before um, Brandon Fugel took over. Don't you still yeah. my thunder? Sorry. Okay. I'm- <laughs> yeah. When no, I you can, to- no, you can no. Say what you need. When I listen to Chris Bartell talk about that, he was out there. Um, first of all, he was out there, which is he and he and another guy when he first went out there. And then they to reduce costs, they got rid of the other guy, and he was out there alone. And I'm like, that violates any possible protocol that you could imagine to have someone securing that property on their own. Like anything could happen to him, and he would just be dead by the time anybody got there. I I just I kind of lost respect for Bigelow at that point. Um, okay, so next uh, person is me, I guess, right? My topic, my, or did uh, anybody? Tim, Tim's Tim didn't go. Go ahead, sir. So I'm going to go the DJ route on this, and I'm going to talk about real quick what is known about Skinwalker Ranch, just briefly. And sometimes I think the known obvious things are the things we overlook the most. Mm-hmm. We know, thank you, CJ, it was purchased by Robert Bigelow an aerospace billionaire, right? We know it is an incredibly remote location that especially decades ago would have been perfect for testing all of our top secret aircraft and other technologies. And you know what? I think that kind of gets overlooked a lot, right? Like we don't actually talk about those parts of it a whole lot. But that's what we know. Now, what about things that it could be? It could be the site of a UFO recovery or some sort of unknown metallurgical remnants of an ancient UFO recovery. You know, we've got a lot of talk now about giant UFOs that they have to put buildings over. Mm-hmm. Um, about a lot of talk about Bob Lazar mentioned deriving technology from ancient UFOs, okay? So it could be the site of something like that. It could also be the site of 
you know, some sort of thinning in the dimensions, if you believe what Robert Grush had to say or or what he alluded to, that per, he's going to call them NHIs because we have no evidence from there. They're from another part of space, which interestingly, we talked to Avi Loeb about the David Grush comments, and he essentially said David Grush was full of crap, that David Grush had no... We have no evidence whatsoever of other dimensions, which I thought that was very interesting that Avi Loeb had that take. But anyway, perhaps Skinwalker Ranch is the site uh, of the thinning of the veil of dimensions, and and uh, we and it perhaps the site of ancient beliefs, ancient things that have happened there, supernatural things with with the native folks there. We've had folks on our show from a, a great folks from a place called Board Camp Crystal Mine in Arkansas, and they have a lot of this similar activity there. Matter of fact, Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates was at their property. They have UFO encounters, and by the way, which left incredible physical evidence of magnetism and and physical damage. They have uh, Bigfoot encounters. They have um, basically teleportation of crystals and other objects there. But what's most exciting about Skinwalker Ranch is, of course, if it's more than one of these things. So if in addition to just being a remote place that's great for testing super top secret things, it's more than that. But also one or more of these other items I mentioned. I'm with CJ. It's currently owned by Brandon Fugel. We know that. And CJ and I and Smitty believe that we also know they're doing legit scientific work there. Yeah, I mean, right, Tim, when when they have that drill bit going in the side of the mountain with 4,000 pounds of pressure and all of a sudden it just can't go any further, but yet the drill bit is not scuffed as as what they would expect to see if it had encountered something that, that would be really abrasive, I mean, that's anomalous. I mean, that's something that's inexplicable. So I take them at face value. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, so All right, so we went, Tim. Matt, so okay, so it's me now, my topic. Um, so real quickly, guys, I have sort of a, an A and a B. It's just, uh, is there a revelation that could come out here about something that's being done that's, say, untoward under our noses that would drive you away from this topic? A. And B, this is just kind of a, a yes or no, but in terms of, uh, we've discussed this on uh, the last episode Bigfoot, are you down for having someone shoot one and bring it in or just let them continue to, you know, be mysterious forest creatures and on their own? Uh, so that one would go to Debs. I know your answer to the second one, but how about how about the first one, Debs? Um, there's nothing that's going to turn me away from the topic, because no matter what it is, if it's, you know, our tech, uh, multidimensional uh, NHI, whatever it is, it's fascinating. And I want to know. Um, and I actually think everything's on the table, by the way. I think it's all of it. Um, so I just, I want to know. And I think we have the right to know. Um, and of course, uh, to the second part, as you said, you already know, uh, no, leave leave the Bigfoot alone. Do not shoot that thing. Leave alone. Yeah, I, and the reason it came up, that Marine Corps guy, and I'll send this off to... Uh, to uh to tim so that he can share it with c j and smitty but it's basically a marine corps guy interviewing with the navy seal and he's basically talking about a ufo craft they encountered in indonesia and um when he went to speak at the stephen greer uh press conference someone approached him and said i know that uh what was inside those connex boxes that were being loaded on that craft and it was it's human trafficking um, there's nothing to necessarily back that up, but I'm saying there's some, there could be an aspect of this that is really off-putting. So that I'm thinking of out, outside the box of something like that that's even more extreme than the things that David Grush said. So with that, we're going to Miss uh, CJ. So <laughs> I'm very tender-hearted. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, uh, I will admit there has been times that we have done this podcast that afterwards I've thought to myself, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> this is too intense. I'm losing too much sleep. I am starting to see and hear things that aren't real <laughs> or, you know, I truly, yeah, there probably is something out there that if I learned about it, I might think, okay, I think I've hit the wall and I need to stop. 
doing any more research so that I can just live normally and sleep at night. Um, I don't know what that is yet because here I am. <laughs> Continue to move forward. Uh, as for Bigfoot, no, I don't want anybody to shoot a Bigfoot. I don't need um, a Bigfoot to die for me to have proof of anything. So, no. All right. Uh, and the next would be Mr. Smitty. I'm is there put something? It. Go ahead, oh, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, I'm going to yes, answer your question. I'm going to put it real country. I'm just going to hang in there like a tick on a hound dog. <laughs> and whatever whatever comes out, it's going to draw me closer, I think, to to the investigative side of it. Just peeling back the layers is something that I enjoy. I, I just love doing research and and digging deeper into things. And, you know, to see some other connection would make us go in that direction possibly and and research that uh, as far as bigfoot goes you know if i see one i'm gonna leave it alone i think everyone else should also so. that's a great answers uh yeah and it, it's just that the more there are things uh I'm, you know as I, tim and i talked about it and everybody knows i'm not a conspiracy guy but there are some things some revelations here that you can't really ignore that that lead to some darker uh aspects of these topics that that are kind of like what cj said are beyond my my comfort level and uh so who knows where 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 it could go uh if if that that box is opened but uh uh did did we get to everybody uh matt nope. needs to go Still matt tim tim next oh actually. tim sorry tim oh no worries so i think the one thing that could turn me off of the ufo phenomenon uap phenomenon is if we really start, in, and by the way, there seems to have, we admit, to be a, some sort of connection um, between UFOs, the UAP phenomenon, and nuclear, um, right? There's some sort of connection there. Um, one surprising thing, when we talked to Mr. Billy, the eyewitness of the Florida Mississippi UFO, one of the over a dozen law enforcement officers, we had him on the show, and this came out of nowhere, totally shocked us, is that, and, and this has not been revealed anywhere. A lot had been known about this case, but this was not anywhere. Is that, um, you know, the day after this incident, he got a phone call and the sheriff answered. And the sheriff said, here, you, you talk to Mr. Billy about it. And it was none other on the phone than Dr. J. Allen Heineck. Wow. Who had some revelations that he revealed to Mr. Billy on the phone. And one of the things he said, you know, we, well, he said, we believe they, they um, seem to be able to use uh, gravitational waves and travel along certain lines of the earth. And that they, uh, you know, he also wanted to know, was there a nuclear facility anywhere close to them that they seem to have some sort of affinity for nuclear. And a lot of our shows, we couldn't help but get tangled up in some previous notions called mad and sad, simultaneous atomic destruction, mutually assured destruction. And that indeed, unfortunately, is a part of this conversation when you talk about all the parties involved and we admit that there's some sort of nuclear uh, connection or correlation going on here. And that would turn me off real quick. I'm going to invoke the biblical here or the Southern with Smitty, you know, uh, it's going to be the, you know, my, my kids and the pets and me, and we're heading to the hills. If, if I see apocalypse Armageddon is about to throw down, right. Um, then that that's gonna turn me off real quick. All of a sudden, I'm gonna be focused on something else besides UFO Twitter and uh, Bigfoot hunting. So I like to do it. I've had this thought experiment about Bigfoots, and I love Bigfoot. Of course, I've written a lot some Bigfoot children's books. If you go to Squatching.com, you'll see them. But my Bigfoot thought experiment is this: What if all the UFO UAP headlines we've had the last few years? were actually about Bigfoot. So you can you imagine Navy admits Bigfoot footage is real. <laughs> okay. What would that do to the world, y'all? What what would that do to the world? And I'll just leave you with that thought experiment. What if the UFO UAP headlines were Bigfoot headlines? And I'll let you have it at that. Let Matt riff on that one. Go ahead, Matt. Oh uh, no, actually, well, well, we'll get to Matt, but bit, and and we'll 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 both uh, have a shot at that at the end. But let's get. Oh, is that is it Matt's turn now? Mm -hmm. It is, and then you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, my friend. 
What am I answering? You know, since uh, Tim put out an, an interesting thought experiment, we've talked about it. What if all the his his questions even better than mine? What if all the UAP headlines were um, were Bigfoot headlines that we've seen since 2017 New York Times article? To be continued. Thanks. Like. Share. Follow, comment, subscribe, support. What's your hot take on Travis Taylor? <laughs> I've got an exclusive for you guys if you okay. want it about yeah, the Alaska. Absolutely. We do. Okay, okay. All things unexplained. So some of that I think, sir, will save for closed session. Mm-hmm.